Thanks, thanks very much. Um, last night I talked about Marx as a political activist and political leader, and in a way this meeting is a continuation of at least some of the issues that came up there. I would say that the greatest practici Marxist practitioner of the, the art of politics was undoubtedly Lenin, the, le the main leader of the Russian Revolution. I mean, if you look at Lenin's very extensive and often very theoretical writings, for example, his studies of Hegel in the, um, at an extraordinary moment in the summer and autumn of 1914 when the First World War was breaking out, all these writings are to do with solving particular political problems. Lenin was reading Hegel to rethink Marxism in the face of the enormous crisis created by the fact that the bulk of the parties of the working class movement had supported that, that war. So Lenin is the greatest practitioner of politics, but the most important theorist of politics. In other words, um, the Marxist figure who thinks most systematically about politics was, was Gramsci. And as I'm going to try and, and bring out, um, he doesn't do this from an academic perspective or a primarily theoretical perspective, but very much as a practitioner of politics himself and as a, as a, as a victim of how things can go wrong for rev revolutionaries. It's worth saying something about the reception of Gramsci. Chris Harmon, one of the leading members and th most important theoreticians of the Socialist Workers' Party, wrote an article back in the late 1970s called Gramsci Against Reformism. And one of his main points was the way in which Gramsci's thought was taken over and misrepresented and used essentially for reformist purposes, um, in particular by the Italian Communist Party after the Second World War, but um, in the 1970s to justify what was called Eurocommunism, in other words, the uh, embrace of reformism in very explicit terms by the then leadership of the Italian Communist Party. And if you look at Italy, Italy has been a source of some of the most important and um, uh, creative thinking about Marxism for the past few decades. But there's a profound division among Italian Marxists. There are lots of Italian Marxists who don't really talk about Gramsci. Uh, Tony Negri is a good example of that, but also people who are influenced by um, Gramsci's great opponent inside the, the Italian Communist Party, Amadeo Bordiga. They won't talk about Gramsci because they identify Gramsci with the reformist mi mi misrepresentations of his thought. Um, but um, I think it's important to insist on Gramsci's significance as a great revolutionary thinker, however his thought has been uh, misrepresented. And just to say something about his life, his life um, shows one very important thing that's um, relevant to the present. He sh his life shows that if you miss revolutionary opportunities, the consequences aren't neutral. In other words, you, missing a revolutionary opportunity isn't like missing the bus, you know, another bus will be along sometime soon. The situation doesn't fundamentally change because you miss a revolutionary opportunity. On the contrary, if you miss a revolutionary opportunity, because of the profound crisis that society is undergoing that produces that opportunity, you will pay a very high price in the shape of counter-revolution. Counter and we see this very clearly in Italy in the years when Gramsci was politically active um, during the First World War and in its aftermath in the 19, 1920s, because Italy experiences a huge upsurge of class struggle in the period immediately after the First World War, what's called the Biennio Rosso, the red two years of 1918 to 1920. All sorts of things happen, but the climax comes in 1920, with the occupation of the factories. Workers in the, crucially in the metal industry, which is the core of Italian cap capitalism in northern Italy, 
occupy the factories. In other words, they go beyond simply going on strike. Occupying the factories is an offensive action. We saw this, for example, in France in 1936 and 1968. We saw it in the US in the mid-1930s and so on. This is an offensive struggle by workers, and it posed the question of political power, as it did, for example, in France in May, June 19, 1968. But what happened then, what happened in Italy in September 1920, was what could have been the beginnings of a revolutionary moment in Italian society is thrown away by the leaders of the Italian workers' movement, the Socialist Party and the trade unions, who essentially negotiate a deal with Giolitti, who was the very crafty bourgeois liberal politician who currently, um, who at the time dominated Italian politics. And the result is not a stabilization of the situation, but the scale of the workers' struggle so terrifies the, the ruling class, that they turn to counter-revolution. Counter they turn to the fascists. The, fascists. the fascist movement emerges as bands of thugs who uh, are organized, and there were a lot of thugs around at the end of the First World War, all these people who'd experienced uh, frontline fighting in the First World War and who were brutalized by the experience. They were easy material, raw material for the fascists. The fascists start as paramilitary bands used by the, uh, the capitalists in the Italian countryside to smash the, uh, the workers' movement, particularly in northern it Italy. But from that, you get a much broader movement led by Mussolini, which takes power in, in 1922. Now, Gramsci wasn't responsible so we see how revolutionary opportunity leads to a crushing of the workers' movement, leads to fascism. Gramsci wasn't in any sense responsible for this lost opportunity. He was one of the leaders of the extreme left in Turin at the time. Turin was the most important center of the metal industry in Italy, and he was very much part of a developing rank-and-file workers' movement that was you know, pushing towards trying to achieve what... Um, the Russian workers had done in 19, 1917, but he suffers the consequences of the lost opportunity. He inherits the mess. He becomes leader of the Italian Communist Party, formed after the defeat uh, in 1920. Um, he in, um, when it's been badly deformed by the ultra-left politics of Bordiga, the first leader of the Italian Communist Party, who, for example, dismisses the, the threat of fascism. And Gramsci himself, like Bordiga, actually, and they were quite friendly in jail, um, two very creative Italian Marxists, though, with quite different concrete political approaches. Like Bordiga himself, Gramsci ends up in jail, and he stays in prison till quite soon before his death in 1937, um, shortly before his death in 1937. And it's while in jail that he writes his famous prison notebooks. The title is a bit of a give giveaway, isn't it? Um, which are these, in the uh, Italian edition, they're three, uh, three volumes of very dense notes, often rewritings of earlier passages where... Gramsci is taking the opportunity of being in prison to think out his ideas systematically and to learn the lessons of the defeat in 1920-22 um, by thinking systematically about the question of power. Polit what Gramsci is about, this is why I talk about Gramsci and the art of politics, is understanding political power, how to get it and how to hang on to it. One of his models is the great early modern Italian thinker Machiavelli. And Gramsci, uh, Machiavelli wrote a famous uh, little book called The Prince, in which he uh, outlines some of the key, what he thinks are the key historical lessons about how to take and hold power. And Gramsci refers to the Revolutionary Party as the modern prince, the modern political actor who is going to be able to take and hold power. Not a prince, the 
product of some sort of absolutist dynastic regime, as in Italy in the 16th century when Machiavelli lived, but rather a collective subject that will um, win the struggle for power as part of a class, self-conscious class struggle. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on some of the key points in Gramsci's three thinking of politics. And the first of these is a rejection of economic determinism. The dominant figure in the Second International, the international socialist movement before the First World War, was the, um, actually it was Czech, the Czech Marxist, um, Karl Kautsky. And Kautsky um, um, argues that socialist revolution will take place by, as he puts it repeatedly, natural necessity. In other words, the economic evolution of capitalism will lead to a greater and greater polarization between bosses and workers. The working class will get stronger and more self-conscious. And eventually, parties like Kautsky's own party, the German Social Democratic Party, will win a majority in the elections and they'll use that parliamentary majority to begin the transition for socialism. And this will take place irresistibly, Kautsky sa says. Now, Gramsci is, I would say, the Marxist thinker who most systematically rejects this idea, rejects the idea that revolution will take place through natural necessity as a result of the economic evolution of capitalism. And there's a famous passage that, even though it's famous, I want to, to read it to you because it's so important. He says... A crisis occurs, sometime lasting for decades. This exceptional duration means that incurable structural contradictions have revealed themselves, reach maturity, and that despite this, the political forces which are struggling to conserve and defend the existing structure are making every effort to cure them within certain limits and to overcome them. This, these incessant and persistent efforts since no social formation will ever admit that, he's, uh, uh, that it has been superseded, form the terrain of the conjunctural, and it's on this, upon this terrain that the forces of opposition organize. So, here Gramsci is saying, capitalism is subject to incurable structural contradictions. He was one of the few Marxists before the Second World War to give proper... Uh, appreciation to Marx's theory of the falling rate of profit in volume three of Capital. It's the tendency of the rate of profit to fall that is the source of the incurable structural contradictions of capitalism. And this can create economic crises that affect the whole of society that go on for decades. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? If anyone went to hear Michael Roberts talking about the Long Depression, whenever it was the day before before yesterday. That's the kind of crisis that we're in. But this doesn't lead to the collapse of capitalism or the victory of socialism. Rather, it creates the terrain on which the forces of the status quo, the forces defending the system, and what Gramsci calls the forces of opposition, the revolutionary wing of the workers' movement, contend to see which which is going to be able to impose their political solution on society. So capitalism, uh, the crises of capitalism, simply create the terrain on which the political struggle is fought out. That's point number one. Point number two, this need, means that Marxism needs to be rethought. Or, as Gramsci insists, we need to go back to Marx's original revolutionary thought. And how Gramsci tries to signal a change is by calling, renaming Marxism the philosophy of praxis. Now, he wasn't the first to use this phrase. Another Italian Marxist of an older generation, Antonio Labriola, came up with this formulation at the end of the 19th century. But it's Gramsci who really drives home the message that central to Marxism is practice. Gramsci took... Marx's thesis on Feuerbach and retranslated them into Italian. And it's in those theses on Feuerbach that Marx himself insists on the primacy of practice. Marxism isn't the passive contemplation 
of the evolution of capitalism that simply plots what's going to happen. Marxism is, is a theory that is oriented on active intervention in the evolution of capitalism with the aim of destroying it. And he has this brilliant passage, which is much less well-known um, than the one I just quoted, which sums this up. He says, the philosophy of praxis does not aim at the peaceful resolution of existing contradictions in history and society, but is the very theory of these contradictions. It is not the instrument of government of the dominant groups in order to gain the consent and exercise hegemony over the subaltern classes. It is the expression of these subaltern classes who want to educate themselves in the art of government and who have an interest in knowing all truths, even the unpleasant ones, and in avoiding the impossible deceptions of the upper class and even more their own. Now, I think that's the most brilliant passage. Three important things that Gramsci says there. The philosophy pra of praxis isn't about pretending that contradictions don't exist or imagining that they can be easily resolved, which is what social democrats can do. Sad that there's this conflict between capital and labor, but if we're nice to each other, we can get past it. Secondly, it's to do with the art of government, but not the art of government as practiced by the ruling class trying to dominate the masses, workers and other oppressed and exploited uh, sections of society. It's, a, it's a, a tool for the workers to train themselves to govern, to take power. And this is one of the great themes of Gramsci's writing, right back to the, uh, his years in Turin when the workers' movement was at its height at the end of the First World War. Workers have to learn. They have to develop themselves into a class that's capable of governing society. It's not automatic that they will do this. Uh, and thirdly, that, this is, uh, that the philosophy of praxis is about challenging not just the deceptions of the ruling class, we know that they're out to deceive us, but also um, to get through the ways in which we deceive ourselves, the way in which the oppressed and exploited can kid themselves that their struggle is going to be easier than it actually, actually is. Now, in that passage, also we have the mention of the concept of hegemony, which is... Everyone knows, more or less, this is Gramsci's key idea. God, I'm going on a lot. How much more have I got? Uh, 12 minutes. 12 minutes? Jesus. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Talk about going on, going on a lot. 15. 15. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, sh I should manage to say something in that time. Um, now, Gramsci's notion of hegemony is, um, originates his reflection on the defeat uh, of the workers' movement of 1924, uh, uh, sorry, of 1920. And there's a very important essay he wrote just before he went to prison called um, Some Aspects of the Southern Question. Uh, Italy, then as now, is divided between North and South, a relatively modern and industrialized North, and a South that in Gramsci's day was di still dominated by massive landing estates. Gramsci came from Sardinia, part of the South, and he's very conscious of this. Now, what he says, and he tells this anecdote, he says, uh, when the factories were occupied in Turin, the army was deployed, and uh, someone talked to some of the soldiers, who were conscripts, of course, and they said, what are you doing here? And the, the, the soldiers said, oh, we've come to deal with the gentleman. What do you mean by the gentleman? The answer was, um, the workers in the factories skilled metal workers, skilled engineers, to put it in British terms, who wore collars and ties, and therefore seemed superior to these peasant conscripts from southern Italy. And for Gramsci, this summed up how the division between north and south and the isolation of the northern working class from the southern pe peasantry, their mutual isolation, weakened the, 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 the workers' movement. And this leads to a, a critique of what he calls the economic corporate approach of the Socialist Party and the union bureaucracy, who just concentrate on winning material concessions um, that can improve workers' living standards and essentially forget about the plight of the peasantry. This dooms the workers' movement to a, what Gramsci calls a subaltern status 
in Italian society. The other side to that is that Gramsci becomes interested in how the ruling class dominates the southern pe peasantry. The kind of deal that um, the northern industrialists, when Italy was unified, made with the southern landowners, um, which essentially preserved the social structure of the south in exchange for a unified Italy. I don't have time to go into it, but if you see the great, um, what's his name, the, the great movie, The Leopard, based on the novel by Lampedusa, it sums this process up absolutely brilliantly. And he notices the way in which a supposedly modern industrial capitalist class relies on the Catholic Church, the priests in every little town and village to keep the southern peasantry subordinate. So this starts him thinking about, about hege hegemony. Um, but, um, and he concludes that if the workers' movement is to take power in Italy, it has to undergo catharsis, which is a slightly strange concept because it's derived from... Oh, Ronnie, why are you ringing me up in the middle of a meeting? Um, the, um, which is uh, derived from Aristotle's theory of tragedy. But what, what by catha catharsis Gramsci means is shifting from a purely economic corporate approach which focuses on winning higher wages to what he calls the ethico-political level, which is when the working class starts thinking about taking power and as part of the process of taking power, projects itself as, to use uh, a concept of the German philosopher Hegel, thinks of itself as a universal class that can offer a solution to all the oppressed and exploited in society. For example, the peasantry in the, in the Italian context. And I, don't, I, I must, um, because I've rabbited on so much, I must summarize a bit. If you look at Gramsci's theory of hegemony, it's really a theory of the state. If you go to any, you know, there are millions of courses and so on. L really, lots and lots of... Gramsci is the most respectable of Marxists. There all these courses. There's this doctrine called Neo-Gramscianism in uh, international relations, which has nothing to do with Gramsci himself. Any, you know, you look at a textbook and so on, it will say Gramsci had a theory of cultural hegemony. It's true he talks about culture a certain amount, um, but for political reasons. The theory of hegemony is a theory of the state, this is crucial to understand in the case of Gramsci. He expands the concept of the state. Uh, he relies on Marx's theory of base and superstructure. The superstructure being, and he loves the phrase that Marx uses in his 1859 preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy, where he talks about the superstructure, politics and so on, ideology, as where human beings become conscious of the conflict in the economic base and fight it out because it suggests an open struggle. There's no predetermined outcome. But Gramsci says we must talk about not just one superstructure, but a plurality of superstructures. And in particular, he draws a distinction between political and civil society, where political society is the state in a narrow sense, the army, the police, the courts, the repressive apparatuses of the state. But um, there's also what he calls civil society, which is notionally not part of the state, but are all sorts of private institutions and associations. The uh, churches, the mass media, um, universities, schools, all sorts of institutions which function in particular to inculcate the, uh, and, and reproduce the hegemony of the ruling class by trying to persuade the mass of the population that the ruling class is ruling not just in its interest, but in the interest of the mass of the, uh, of the, um, of the populations. So Gramsci says, um, he says, the state equals civil society plus political society. In other words, hegemony protected by the armor of coercion. Hegemony protected by the armor of coercion. I think that's a fantastic phrase. In other words, the ruling class, uh, to retain power, to win and retain power, they have to get the mass of the population to accept that they ha have the right to rule. 
they have to exercise what Gramsci calls moral and intellectual leadership. And that's crucial to the idea of hegemony. But you can't separate that moral and intellectual leadership from what Gramsci sometimes calls domination. Coercive, the coercive dominance of the ruling class, their monopoly of force. That's why it's hegemony armored by coercion. And the state has to be understood as incorporating both um, a political society, the repressive institutions, but also the, uh, the institutions of civil society that are crucial to perpetuating the domination of the ruling class. Okay. Now, um, some people have interpreted this set of concepts and some of the ambiguities they discovered this to argue that Gramsci, in formulating this theory of hegemony, was retreating from revolutionary Marxism, uh, was giving up on the idea of the necessity of smashing the state. This is absolutely wrong. Gramsci saw himself as a Leninist. He saw himself as developing systematically the lessons of what Lenin and the Bolsheviks had been able to achieve in Russia. Their debates that took place among the communists in prison that make it clear that Gramsci still thought it was necessary to overthrow the capitalist state by force. He talked about how the communists, in any revival of struggle against the fascist regime, had to develop a military wing, they had to be prepared for armed struggle, and, and so, so on and so forth. So Gramsci, Gra Gramsci is trying to reformulate the theory of revolution, but in a, in a way that brings out that creating the conditions for revolution are much more complex than simply um, preparing for a, some moment of final confrontation. In particular, for Gramsci, the Communist Party, for us, a revolutionary socialist organization, has to see itself as the, the, the node, the, the, the embryo of a new hegemonic apparatus that can persuade the mass of the oppressed and exploited that it's in their interest for socialist revolution to take place. This leads me then to another crucial uh, idea that Gramsci advances. Well, it's, an it's a development of something that is um, already there in uh, things that I've already said, that the struggle for he hegemony is a two-way process. The, if revolutionaries are operating properly, they're preparing themselves to become a hegemonic force. But the bourgeoisie do the same. They seek to maintain their hegemony and, if necessary, to reconstruct it. And Gramsci uses the idea of passive revolution to bring this out. He says when you have this profound crisis of society, and remember Gramsci is writing the prison notebooks during the Great Depression, the greatest crisis in the history, history of, of capitalism, the bourgeoisie just can't carry on in the old way, to quote, quote Lenin, they have to reconstruct their hegemony. And he argues that this, uh, and I'm drawing here on the, the work of a French Marxist, André Tossel, who unfortunately died a couple of years ago, but brings out this side of Gramsci's thought very well. He says, what in the context of the rise of fascism and the crisis of the 1930s, this involves passive revolution. In other words, a reconstruction of the state and society that seeks to incorporate, incorporate elements of the socialist alternative, what Gramsci calls the antithesis, but in a way that maintains bourgeois domination. And he says, passive revolution takes two forms. One is fascism. The fascists, uh, and this is particularly true, of course, the na Nazis, who come along a bit later, seek to reconstruct society and the economy. In particular, they seek to introduce elements of planning. They don't simply rely on market economic mechanisms to, to run capitalism. This is a reflection of... Um, this is, this um, is an attempt to uh, acknowledge that capitalism requires reconstruction. It can't simply carry on in the old way. That's one form of passive revolution. Passive revolution, there's a restructuring of society, but one that keeps the masses passive and dominated. The other form is what Gramsci calls Americanism and Fordism, but actually, Tossel, I think, says very well, is best ex expressed in Roosevelt's New Deal in the mid-1930s. Mid 
which is a liberal reconstruction of capitalism, which bases itself on the kind of economic transformations that are going on in the US with the development of mass production and mass consumption, symbolized by Ford and the way in which Ford's mass production is supposed to be producing cars that his own workers can, can buy. And also there's a transformation, Gramsci says, of workers' subjectivity into the kind of self-controlled consumer who will both work and buy according to the requirements of capitalism. So capitalism doesn't stand still in the 1930s, but it seeks to reconstruct itself through these two forms of passive revolution. And this underlines the way in which Gramsci is presenting even the most profound crisis of capitalism as an open situation in which there are a number of possible alternatives, not simply the preordained victory of socialist revolution. Now, I think this is an immensely fertile body of writing. Uh, there are all sorts of questions about how well it applies to the present. Chris Harmon, in his uh, discussion of Gramsci in the 1970s, points out that civil society is much weaker than it was. In the advanced capitalist countries, far fewer people go to church. Many of the kind of private associations that even the workers' movement developed different kinds of social clubs, film clubs, literary societies, and, and so on, that were true even of the workers' movement in Britain, have withered, withered away. We live in much more atomized and media-dominated societies. So there's a question of how much Gramsci's theory of civil society holds up to the present. How does his notion of passive revolution hold up? Um, some people argue that neoliberalism is a contemporary form of passive revolution. But I think that underestimates um, the, uh, something that Gramsci himself doesn't fully confront. When you talk about the hold of an ideology, you need to differentiate its hold on the ruling class from its hold on the masses. Neoliberalism unites the bulk of the ruling classes of the advanced capitalist countries. His hold on the ma its hold on the mass of the population is much weaker, both in good ways, the remnants of social democratic consciousness that survive, but also in bad ways, the power of racism and nationalism, which, of course, neoliberalism has always, always coexisted with. So there's no way in which we can mechanically lower Gramsci's ideas onto the present. We need to think critically about, as is true of Marx or Lenin or Trotsky or whoever, critically about how to apply his ideas to the, the present. But nevertheless, he provides a framework of thinking about politics, which I think is immensely valuable for revolutionary Marxists. So thank you, Jane. You can start us off. Um, 30 years ago, I um, undertook a degree at the Polytechnic of Wales, which was called Communication <laughs> Studies. And um, it was a degree that that sought to understand politics, philosophy, culture, art, um, join them all together um, with a theory which was something which came as a bit of a shock to me, which is postmodernism and deconstruction. And during that degree, I often felt myself lost in a kind of see a kind of onslaught of different thinkers who seemed to be at the time somewhat obscure, theoretical, and very difficult to relate to in your real life. I had to study um, Jacques Derrida, uh, Lacan, Michel Foucault, and Gremsky. And all these people seemed to be at the time of just a mass that I couldn't really separate them out from each other or, or what they meant to me in, in my d life outside the polytechnic which has seemed a very practical life, taking on, on, on issues of the, an anti-abortion bill, uh, Clause 28, the, uh, the aggressions of, of Thatcherism, and never, I felt like I was living a, a double life, and in 
looking at those theories at the time, I think the way they were presented to me, I couldn't distinguish one thinker from another. But 30 years later, I never ever come back to either Foucault or Derrida, but I found Gremsky something that is, when you look at it again, infinitely useful. And in everyday life, there are a what he seems to offer to me is a lot of practical advice on how to deal with things. Um, something quite recently, common sense versus good sense, a very simple concept of, well, you know, common sense, why do people think these things that sometimes seem to you ridiculous and not in their interest to act that way? Um, the things that, that make up a kind of received wisdom that are made up for all the influences in your life, how do you counteract that common sense thinking? He said to us all the time, use your common, that's not common sense. Something that counteracts it, good sense. You know, a different way of breaking it down and saying, what is it really about? So, uh, you know, out of all those people I would dismiss, I'd say Gremsky's the one to keep and, and, and use. Lovely. Thank you. And, sorry. David's going to be followed by John Sinar. <clears throat> yeah, very much following on the previous comrade. As a student, I read quite a lot of grammatry. What the previous comrade said about good sense, common sense, I think is, is very important, about the role of worker intellectuals, actually doing that battle within the working class to fight for those elements of progressive ideas as against the elements of reactionary ideas within the working class. Also about hegemony, one, uh, while uh, Alex was speaking, I was thinking about what he said about how the working class in the North has to recognize the importance of defending the peasantry in the South. It's, it's what Lenin said about tribune of the oppressed. I think it's a very similar, similar idea. But I live in, in Barcelona, not actually in Spain, but Podemos uses, misuses a version of Gramsci that I frankly don't recognize. I'm sure there's bits in those books that I didn't read. But um, concept of national, cult, cultural, national, popular, something or other. That in practice, it seems to mean that you follow the opinion polls and do whatever they say, and that when the Spanish team, thankfully out of the World Cup, when they won a match, you tweet from Podemos celebrating the victory of the Spanish football team. Now, that seems to me a slightly abusive way to, to treat Gramsci. And the question of hegemony, I mean, yes, it's not, no longer about trying to fight uh, for radical ideas within, the, within society and within the working class. It is simply about following opinion polls. But the final point is, what do we do about that? I mean, I'm, I'm not inclined to get into detailed analysis of what uh, Gramsci said about national popular and what Pablo Iglesias is saying. I think we do need to have theoretical arguments, but I'd say let's try and focus it on what we really need to do and not these strange theoretical stuff. But then above all, what we need to do is build the alternative, because Podemos was a false alternative that people believed in, like Syriza and like other things we could mention. But it's not enough just to say, that's crap. It is crap. But crap is not a dialectical word. Let's say some <laughs> dialectical version of crap. But we, we need to build the alternative, which we need all the positive things that Gramsci said and not get bogged down in all the theoretical abstractions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, John is going to be followed by Chin. Yeah, I think one of the great things about Gramsci is he helps us to understand how power functions in a modern capitalist state. I think it's a very... The concept of hegemony is, is, I think, valid today. Uh, and it really, uh, I mean, the, the idea that the subaltern classes consent to the rule by the dominant, by the he hegemonic power is something which is real. And I can give you some examples of it today. We can talk, for instance, about the hegemony of fossil fuel capital. And I can give you just, a, just one example which helps me to understand something that just recently happened last month. So um, Heathrow Airport is, you know, as a representative of a certain interest of fossil fuel capital and of the bourgeois class, is able to create a coalition of interest to uh, propagate its interests. So for instance, when they had the vote on the Heathrow, um, not only do they have the government defending them and saying, yeah, we need to expand, but they also have the leader of the trade unions um, basically accepting the worldview, the organic view of the dominant class saying, yeah, we need, we need the jobs and not offering an alternative. And if you know, the working class aspires to leadership, to be the contending hegemonic class, it has to represent, it has to provide intellectual and moral leadership and say, no, we can't 
uh, expand fossil fuel capitalism because it's going to burn the planet. That's an example of intellectual and moral leadership. And it's also, to me, shows how capitalist power works. It doesn't simply use the unarmed body of men. It has all these levers, uh, and that includes the Labour Party, the, 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 the ruling class, has its representatives inside the Labour Party defending its interests. So when people say, we only need to take over the Labour Party and we can deliver socialism, I say, you're just, you're just winning over the outer ditch of the fortification. There are many layers of defence that the, that the ruling class has. Uh, and the ultimate uh, defence is actually the military force at the end of the day. But it has this whole vast uh, network of defences which it can use. And I think these ideas are still valid. Uh, but we need to absolutely agree with uh, Alex Klinikos. We, need to sim we can't simply mechanically impose his writings on the current situation. We need to analyse them concretely. OK. Um... The next speaker is Chin, who, if you, I'm just going to ask a question first, though, and Chin will be followed by Rebecca. Uh, Jeannie Boyle has asked a question uh, she wants me to read out. Was Gramsci a member of a party? Did he argue for the building of a revolutionary party as the SWP does? Thanks, Chin. Hi. Yeah, I have a question. Um, could you um, say a bit more about how, um, what, how Gramsci followed the developments of uh, the Russian Revolution? And I'm thinking in particular on um, you know, the, the new economic policy that was put forward at the time. But partly because I heard a, a strange argument about that where I think generally like Marxists tend to see that like as a kind of like retreat because of um, international isolation of the Russian Revolution. But um, I read some academic, I think his name was uh, Peter Thomas, who said that actually um, Gramsci saw, uh, saw that development as some kind of offensive uh, in the sense that um, what, uh, what um, the Bolshevik were trying to put forward was to build like some kind of a, wo a working class leadership that presented itself different from what was before. And that developed itself in trying to like raise the, um, the uh, economic and, and, cultural, uh, and cultural level of the p uh, peasantry, which concretely translated itself in terms of like uh, literacy campaigns and stuff like that. So I, I wonder, what are your thoughts on that? Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jin. Um, Rebecca is going to be followed by John Parrington. Hi. Um, I had a, another question, and I hope it's sort of based on me correctly understanding something. I know that Alex was talking about um, Gramsci looking at the division between the, the working classes in the north of Italy and seeing the division between them and the peasantry in the south. And I just wondered... Um, we often look back to 1917 as our tradition, and I wondered how much um, Gramsci was influenced looking back to 1917 and the attempts to organise the unemployed into sort of separate unions and Soviets themselves. I heard a really fascinating talk a couple of years ago about the role of the unemployed workers and Lenin's sort of commitment to trying to make sure that it wasn't just the working classes who were organised, but actually that within those early years after 1917, that all all were organised, and I wondered whether that was something that influenced his ideas as well. Okay. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Um, John, is, John Parrington is going to be followed by John Rose. Yeah, I'm interested to talk about Gramsci's notion of this uh, contradictory consciousness, because Gramsci talked about this in the context of a worker's consciousness and how this can change in struggle. So he talked about the fact there's one kind of, it's almost like there's two kind of consciousnesses in a person. One that's kind of affected by the activity as a worker and, and, and a striker and all those kind of things and being a working class person. And secondly, all the things that we inherit, uh, you know, from our parents, from, from our teachers, from you know, the, the society itself and, and talking really about how this kind of balance in, in, in consciousness can, can change. And I'm particularly interested to relate this to uh, ideas that were also being developed at the time in Russia by people like Vygotsky and Voloshinov, who were looking at ways to try and explain such a kind of thing in terms of how the brain works. And what's interesting is that they come up with ideas about the importance of language. And in a sense, and Voloshinov, for instance, talked about the fact that consciousness is a 
as a social entity in many ways. He talked about being like a tenant in the edifice of ideological science, i.e. that there's a kind of a, it's constructed from, from all the kind of uh, language and things that you get as, as, as growing up and, and the kind of ideas you get. But there's also the fact that you as an individual have got thought that's kind of bubbling up from inside you, all your emotions and all the kind of your personality that then has an impact on that. And the fact that your experience ties into that means there's a kind of fluidity to consciousness uh, that, that, can, that can actually change. And it's really interesting that at the moment, there's increasing evidence about how this might relate to how the brain works. For instance, evidence that different frequencies of brain waves can actually reconfigure parts of the brain, linking it to uh, Freud's theory of the unconscious. So how is it that we have ideas that we can't always express, but sometimes we can then start to try and come to grips with them. Uh, and this is all, as I say, linked to, to brain structure. Now, how does this relate to struggle? Well, the interesting thing is, I think you can see how in struggle, how ideas change. You can see how that kind of uh, contradictory consciousness can, can really change in quite specific ways. So I just want to give two examples. One from the 19th century, the Match Girl strike, uh, and the second one is, is, is this year, the, the UK strike. Because it's interesting, in the, the Match Girl strike, on the one hand, you had this group of, of workers, some as young as you know, 12 or, or, or 13 or whatever, young, young women in incredibly bad conditions. The last people they expect to be the kind of vanguard of what became the mass unionization movement at the time, when basically unskilled workers were, were unionized for the first time. And it's interesting that the, one of the, the metaphors the match girls themselves use about their struggle was the, um, the fact it was like a, the, tin, the, 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 the kindling that, that set the fire going, and that was then used to explain how this could also burst into flame in, in a much bigger way in the rest of London. And secondly, the UK strike, just to end on this, the fact that on the picket lines where you had kind of all sorts of groups of workers together from the universities that had never really been in that kind of context together start to go way beyond the kind of pension strike, uh, the pensions issue itself and relate to much bigger issues, marketization, gender issues, governance in the universities, because the kind of the environment they were discussing these things in a completely change, and it meant they could look at the meaning of, 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 of their lives in the universities in a completely different way. I think that's how consciousness can change. But the, sorry, the very final point is that revolutions can help crystallize that, that change in consciousness, and that's, that's a key role that we play. Thank, Thank you, John. Uh, just before the next John uh, speaks, uh, another question. It doesn't say who it's from, but it says, I found your explanation of passive revolution very useful. Could you also say something about the concept of the integral state and whether it can be applied today? Thank you for the question. John. Yes, um, the phrase philosophy and praxis um, comes across in a rather clumsy way, and I want to just to dwell on something that's very important in Gramsci and the use of that word philosophy and the fact that Gramsci was very, in, in the modern prints in particular, is very adamant that ordinary people are philosophers, not just can become philosophers, mm. but can begin to think themselves, even in, in, with, with a language and a thought process which isn't as sophisticated as formally trained philosophers, nevertheless, what they're thinking about and trying to interpret the world around them is as important. And that's, that's a, a profoundly important insight. And the person who developed it uh, 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 in a very effective way was Chris Harmon. Alex referred to Chris's intervention with Gramsci and Gramscian reformism in the 70s. But Chris, in 1968, as a result directly of the 1968 experience, I had the good fortune to know Chris well at that time when he was writing the essay, Party and Class. When he had, and this is when I first heard about Gramsci, when he introduces Gramsci and Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, not just introduces them, but also fuses their aspects of their thinking around the focus of what, how do we understand the struggle that's allied, at least momentarily, students and workers? What does that really mean and how we develop Marxist politics and the working class movement? And Chris does that in a very, I think, a very original way. And it's essentially based on Gramsci's thinking, which is it's not just about an alliance between workers and students. It's also about students coming into the same organization as workers and how they relate to each other. What is the relationship between them when they're in the same organization? How do they help to build that organization? How does the worker learn from the student? How does the student learn from the worker? And it's a two-way process. And it's an incredibly important process. And it isn't, it isn't really unique to um, Gramsci or indeed to Chris. Of course, it's the way in which Lenin himself conceived of building the Bolshevik party and did try to build the Bolshevik party. And it's especially relevant to those factory committees 
both in the Russian Revolution and in the factory committees that Alex refers to in Turin, about the worker leaders, the rank-and-file activists and the leaders that Gramsci has a direct relationship with when he's editing the paper, and in many ways his thoughts about these processes are himself, in his own head, directly re uh, 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 rising from the relationship he has with those workers in struggle. And he sees the possibility of them being leaders. Uh, Dave from Spain talked about the, the phrase tribunes of the people. They're not just leaders in their factory. They're going to be leaders in a wider sense of the oppressed. But also, even if they've not read very much, they're going to quickly learn about what the vision of socialism is about and be able to articulate that for the workers around them. So this is not, and, and, and also the possibility of running the factories is not so straightforward. Lots of workers don't feel they can work, run the factory, even if they're in occupation. They aren't, and indeed they did in Turin, it was very unusual. It wasn't simply a passive occupation. It was about beginning to reorganize production. That was a fantastic challenge. It meant bringing on board some of the professional engineers. It meant a, a, a direct challenge both to the employer and the ruling class. And to have the confidence to do that, not just because you've got a huge kind of battalion behind you, that's essential, but also to, to intellectually to be convinced that's possible. So that's, I think, an incredibly important Lesson, the creation of worker intellectuals as, as worker leaders. Okay, thank you, John. Um, the, did I say, sorry, it's you, William, sorry, I forgot to say, it's you, Williams, who will then be followed by Panos Gorganos from our uh, Greek organisation. But just before you he speaks, I'm just going to say there's been a couple of references to somebody called Chris Harmon. Uh, most, a lot of us will know Chris. Some of you may not have heard of Chris Harmon before. Unfortunately, he was a leading comrade in the party who unfortunately died too early. But there are numerous books of Chris Harmon's on the stall. He was a key member, uh, theoretical, he made key theoretical contributions to our organisation. And I think he's probably one of the clearest Marxist writers ever, to be honest. And for those of you who don't know him, I would go to the bookstall, I'd speak to the people behind the stall. His history of the world has to be read by everybody. It is a marvellous, marvellous book, and it's accessible to anyone. So, you know, he's in our DNA, uh, isn't he? And everyone needs to read him, really. I highly recommend him. Uh, Huey. Yeah, um, one of the things, Alex... Uh, I guess challenged us is to think about um, what, th what there is in great relevance in terms of today and can you simply transpose what uh, Gramsci was arguing all those years ago. I think one of the concepts I think I find useful is the, is the notion of organic crisis. That you can have crisis in systems and political structures which go to the very, very deep and very, very uh, depth of, 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 the, of, of the society itself. That is, you can have crises in government which can be a scandal, can be a miscalculation by the government, but essentially it doesn't reflect a deeper uh, problem and malaise with inside the, 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 inside the system. I think... When Gramsci talks about organic crisis, it's about something that goes much, much deeper. And I think if you think about today, this is, this is a very, very useful concept. And if you talk about when Gramsci comments on that in periods of great crisis, that the traditional parties, the parties who represent traditionally the major contending classes, often become separated from each other, dislocated, and this opens up a hugely volatile situation. I think this is very, again, useful. If you look across Europe, this is un we are different in this, in, in terms of Britain, the main, if you like, political expression of working class people, social democracy, uh, traditionally, it is in deep, deep crisis. If you think in Britain, what is the party that treat, attempts to represent the ruling class? It is the British Conservative Party, whose foreign secretary says, fuck business. There is a dislocation between the main political representatives of the main, uh, main political classes, and therefore the volatility Gramsci was talking about was that the, in those situations are very dangerous. He talks about mm. Caesarism, essentially Mussolini. But it's a, it, it, that great shifts can take place. Opportunities for the right can come about, but also opportunities for our side to make very, very swift uh, uh, advances. I think that within Gramsci is very useful if you're thinking about uh, today. The last comment I wanted to make was on the question of civil society. And I'm, just to ask uh, Alex a question, because 
I take what Chris Harmon was saying about the decline of many of those uh, organizations, but what about the question of uh, education, which must be on a much bigger scale today than uh, what happened in Italy and, that, and how, that does, how does that play in? Okay, thank you, Yui. Um, I should have said, uh, Panos will be our last contributor to this session, but thank you all very much for uh, making this a very interesting, I think, discussion and debate. Oh. Oh. He's an old fan of mine. Thank you. Right, Panos. Uh, a couple of points uh, that may be of interest in uh, today's context. Um, the first one is on the role of political parties uh, in uh, establishing the hegemony of, uh, of the ruling class. Uh, we tend to think of political parties as uh, simply managers of the state, of the repressive apparatus, or of the economic intervention of the state. Uh, but they are not just that. They are also uh, agents that take political initiatives that uh, involve the, the mass of the population, sections of the working class or uh, the other classes. And this is a very important role in uh, uh, establishing the hegemony of, of the ruling class. So when we have a political crisis, when the traditional parties uh, of the ruling class uh, are in a mess, as they are today in, uh, in many places. Uh, this is a situation that weakens the hegemony of, of the working class, of, uh, of the ruling class. This is an aspect that uh, we need to think about because we think of the political crisis as an opportunity for the rise of fascism and, uh, and the far right, but uh, it also creates cracks uh, for the ruling class that uh, are important for, for, for our side. And uh, we, because of that, it, the second point is on Gramsci, on, uh, on our political party, uh, on the Revolutionary Party of, of the Working Class. An important document that uh, Gramsci contributed before he was in prison were the theses for, for the Congress of the Communist Party uh, in Lyon, in France. Uh, they were in, in exile. A, a very important document that uh, outlines and develops uh, the ideas of, of the Leninist party. Uh, I think it's a, it's a document that uh, is very helpful in uh, establishing that the kind of party that we need to build is not an elitist party, which is a very common fault on, on, on our side. Uh, I think these two uh, together are aspects of the work of Gramsci that is very, very useful in dealing with the present situation where we have to build revolutionary organization capable of uh, uh, seizing the opportunities that the cracks uh, in, the, in the hegemony of, of the ruling class appear because of the political crisis uh, of the system. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, I think it's been a really excellent discussion uh, and lots of really interesting points that are made and I, you know, lots of people made very substantial contributions that I'm not going to repeat or really comment on because I agree with them or need to think about what they say. Just briefly, um, Dave from Barcelona mentioned how the leaders of Podemos misuse Gramsci and it's worth emphasizing that. Um, um, because Podemos is a significant force on the left internationally these days. The source of their misrepresentation um, is a book that was actually first published in Britain, Hegemony and Social, Socialist Strategy, by two academics uh, based in Britain, Ernesto Leclerc and Chantal Mouffe, although neither... I mean, Leclerc was Argentinian and Mouffe is, is, is French. And what they did... Um, was to, to take Gramsci's idea of hegemony and remove it from its context in Marx's theory of history and of class, class struggle and to link it up with um, ideas, I mean, 
who, who was it? Jane was talking about this kind of amalgam of different philosophers that she confronted at university, but in particular to fuse Gramsci's... They sought to fuse Gramsci's notion of hegemony with post-structuralist ideas der deriving particularly from the thought of Jacques Derrida. And without going into it, they essentially remove... Um, uh, Gramsci's notion of hegemony from its moorings in class and class struggle, and that completely denatures his ideas and turns it into a kind of set of, of technical tools. So that's one point. There are a couple of questions from Chin and Rebecca about the significance of the Russian Revolution for Gramsci. It was enormous. Um, he rallied to the Russian Rev Revolution. He became a founder of the Italian Communist Party and later its leader. In the early 1920s, he was very involved in the Communist International and discussions with people like Trotsky and Zinoviev, the, some of the leaders of the revolution, and so, so, so on and so forth. But um, the, the very idea of hegemony is derived from discussions within the Russian revolutionary movement because the, the Russian version of the word hegemony, of course, it's a Greek word like all important words, um, the, the, uh, was used uh, in the Bolshevik party as a way of trying to represent the relationship between the working class and the peasantry, because, of course, in Russia, the peasants were a majority of the population in, in 1917, and hegemony was the, the way that the Bolsheviks tried to understand the role of leadership that the Bolsheviks would exercise over the, the, the peasantry. That then relates to the question of the new economic policy that was introduced in, I think, March 1921 by the Bolsheviks, which involved relying much more on market mechanisms than direct political orders and sometimes straightforward armed co coercion in order to get the peasants to produce and feed the cities and feed the workers and so, so on and so forth. Now, I think it's true that initially it was understood as a re retreat, but it's interesting to see in Lenin's last writings, he's thinking of a much more long-term relationship between the working class and the peasantry in which gradually over time uh, the example of successful socialist production will win peasant, the peasants away from a very individualistic mode of life and get them to move in a communist direction. And I think it's that understanding of the new economic policy that Gramsci later develops and, and builds on, although one has to say that when it came to the great dispute inside the Bolshevik party after Lenin's death, Gramsci didn't support Trotsky and sided more with Zinoviev, who played a sort of cons a balancing role between Trotsky and Stalin, and their formulations that he uses in the context of those debates about the national popular, which have been used and abused, um, for example, by Podemos, but also, for example, in Greece in, in, in recent years. Um, so it's not that Gramsci was always right or anything like that, uh, absolutely not. Um, John Parrington, when talking about the importance of language and the kind of theories of language that developed in Russia after the re revolution, linguistics was the main thing that Gramsci studied at university. And there's a lot of discussion of, of language in, uh, in the prison notebooks. It's one of the main kind of intellectual sources that he, that he builds on, although he doesn't develop the kind of systematic understanding of language that we find, for example, in Voloshinov and Mikhail Bakhtin. It's very hard to distinguish between the two of them, in, in my view. Um, and um, I, th I can't remember who it was, but someone talked about Gramsci's notion of philosophy and this idea that everyone is a philosopher, um, which actually isn't his formulation. It comes from the Italian liberal Hegelian philosopher Benedetto Croce. But what it relates is to a key idea of Gramsci's, which is that um, implicit in the practice of specific classes is a conception of the world. In other words, um, the work, for example, crucially, in the case of workers, workers, by their practice, because they're involved in social production, in cooperation in large scale, implicit in their practice, is a communist conception of the world. 
the only way to make sense of workers' practice is through a communist conception of the world. The problem is that normally workers live under the domination of capitalism, and therefore whatever kind of communist intuitions they have coexist from all sorts of ideas that come from the prevailing society, ideas that may date back to the Stone Age, belief in different kinds of magic and, 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 and so on, luck, um, you know, astrology, all, all that kind of thing, but also b bourgeois ideas and ideas that bind the workers to the bourgeoisie like nationalism and much worse racism. This is the core of his idea of contradictory consciousness. And he says, if you have contradictory ideas in your head, you're likely to be paralyzed practically and passive. So um, everyone is a philosopher in the sense that workers have implicit in their practice a communist conception of the world. And the role of philosophy is to, of a specifically Marxist philosophy, is to articulate systematically that communist conception of the world and to defend it against the competing bourgeois and other forms of reactionary ideas. But this isn't a disembodied intellectual activity. This is cruci a crucial part of the work of a revolutionary party through its practice, through its involvement in workers' struggles, in workers' everyday life, it inculcates this systematic critique of capitalist society and vision of a communist future that can begin to give workers a sense that they can be the hegemonic class, they can rule for society as a, uh, as a whole in the interests of the mass of the, the population. So another question was, was Gra did Gramsci call for the building of a revolutionary party? Yes, he did. Uh, and he was extremely active in building the Communist Party in, his early, in its early years. This was cut short by the fascist counter-revolution. But when Gramsci talks about he hegemony, yep, yep, it's not, you know, it's not something that floats in the air that is formulated by philosophers understood as academic intellectuals. The development of a a Marxist, a communist philosophy is a critical part of the practice of a revolutionary party that can play a central role in the overthrow of capitalism.